Um, so happy to have you all here. And I'm really excited um, about having Kaylee here today because um, we're going to be talking about one of the most important topics to me. And I think I wrote this to you guys in the email that I literally invited her for myself because I just want to learn <laughs> new ideas from my blog. Um, so we're really looking forward to this. We're seeing loads of people filing in, but you, it looks like we've had enough time. So I'm just going to literally just hand it over to you. Um, guys, feel free to send over all your questions in the chat. I will be filtering that through uh, for Kaylee um, as she goes. And at the end of her presentation, I will ask everything. So um, yeah, let's get started. Uh, take it away. <laughs> all right, great. Well, hello everyone. I am Kaylee Moore. Um, I live in central Illinois and I'm a freelance writer. I work mostly with e-commerce and SaaS companies, um, folks like Campaign Monitor, AT&T, um, kind of a variety of companies in, in regard to size and, and industry, but all kind of fall within that general world. So the good thing about that for me is that for the past four years, I've gotten to see a lot of different companies um, and how they approach content, how they approach their blogs. And it's changed a lot in those four years. It's really kind of evolved. And um, one of the big things I can tell you that I've seen this year especially is that a lot of people are writing more long form content now. And they're, they're spending more time and investing more money into creating longer form pieces of blog content, which I think is great. I think that that's important because a lot of the times those longer pieces of content that have a lot of examples and, and really get into detail, they're a lot more value driven than some of the shorter like 500 word or so posts. So I think that this is a good trend and I know that there's data, especially I just saw a set from Orbit Media come out that backs that up. So I think that that's kind of an interesting shift in general. But what I want to talk about today is how do you take the content that you're creating for your blog content, whether it's for yourself or the brands that you work for or your own company, how do you take that and make it produce the results that you need? Because even if you're a one person team or if you're working for a company, you have numbers to report and you need to show that it's, it's a worthwhile endeavor to keep blogging. And so I think the question that a lot of teams are asking themselves right now is, why, why does this matter? Why does blogging matter to us? So um, I'm going to pull up some slides here. I'm going to disappear for a little bit, but um, I'll still be talking. So I'll pop back in at the end when we do questions, but I am going to use the slides for this. So just kind of enjoy the sound of my voice, I guess. <laughs> so I'm going to switch the slides. And while you're doing that, I'm just going to ask you guys to kindly let me know in the chat that you can hear us and that everything's working well. Um, and that will help me just to know that you guys can hear everything. Audio is perfect. Thank you, Sue, and thank you, Kate, and everyone else. You guys are awesome. Um, okay, cool. So take it away. Sorry. Okay, so just to make sure, can you see my full screen slide? I can, yes. We okay, will. great. <laughs> I can't see my screen otherwise, so that's good to know. <laughs> okay, so this is our topic today, seven fail proof proof steps for a high converting blog strategy. And I, like I said, the point of this is, you know, why does it matter? Why does blogging matter? And what can we do to make sure that what we're doing with our blogging efforts is worth our time and money that we're, we're putting into these efforts? So first of all, let's talk about just kind of from a high level perspective, why this, this topic matters. The first thing is that Let's be honest, there's a lot of garbage produced every single day when it comes to blog content. The environment is extremely noisy. There's almost 3 million posts published every day. And there's a lot of competition. There are a lot of companies that are maybe in your same niche or your same industry that are publishing posts on a regular basis. And so the problem we run into is that sometimes those topics, they just don't resonate with the target audience. And there's a couple of reasons that that happens from what I've seen from my experience. Um, a few of those reasons are, number one, people just can't dream up relevant or interesting ideas for the audience. They're, they're really spinning their wheels. They've been blogging for a long time and they just don't have any good ideas anymore. They're, they're really kind of feeling burnt out. Another thing is a lot of people just look to their competitors and they look at the types of posts that they're creating and they try to do that. 
they try to, to one up them a little bit with a very similar type of post, whether it's the same subject matter or the same kind of how to, I see that happen a lot. The other things that happen are that sometimes people make assumptions about what their audience wants, or they purely write for their marketing objectives, which just doesn't work because they're thinking, okay, well, we're going to create some blog content that drives sales for our company, or we're going to work on really promoting the product in this blog post, or we're going to work on lead gen. And all those things are great from the marketing perspective, but for the reader, for the audience, a lot of the time that just doesn't translate and it really, it kind of falls flat, which is not good news for, for companies, especially who are investing time and money into creating blog to blog, excuse me, blog content, because it's a waste of time and money. If you're hiring freelancers or if you're tying up a marketing person's time with creating this content and it's not working, that's, that's purely a waste of time. It's a waste of time and it's a waste of money. So you have to produce results with your blog. You have to show that it's working. Otherwise, you're literally just churning out content for, for no point, which is not, that's not something you want to be doing. So, so what do you do about it? And that is one of the biggest questions that people come to me with is, well, what can we do to make our strategy better? And, you know, I don't consider myself a content strategist. I'm usually on the writer side. But with the variety of companies that I've worked with over the past four years of doing this full time, I do have some insights that I think would be helpful for anyone who's watching this. So that's, that's what I want to really dive into next. So jumping right in here. Um, step one, I think this is the most important slide of the whole presentation today. And this is my number one tip for any company that comes to me and is like, how do we fix our blog strategy? How can we do better? The first step is to poll your audience, okay? So you literally, you have to go to your audience. You have to ask your current readers what they want from you. Um, you have to give them a voice in that conversation and, and, and really make sure that you're writing about the things that they, they want to hear from you and that they need to hear from you. Um, so there's a lot of ways you can do that. Um, when, when you go to them and you ask these questions, you need, to, you need to kind of be strategic. You need to ask questions like, what was the most valuable post you read recently about whatever industry you're in or whatever product you're writing about? Um, what are the topics that you read about most often? Um, who are some of your favorite bloggers? You know, who do you, who do you look to for really high quality information? Questions like these are what's going to help you really get a better grasp on what your company needs to be writing about when they're, when they're blogging because a lot of the time we, we build out these great buyer personas or customer personas and we think we know the customer so well or we think we know the reader so well. But the fact of the matter is we really just don't unless we ask them directly because every audience is so unique. They're so different and they have really kind of specific needs based on what they're looking for and what pain points they're facing. So how do you go about collecting that information? Um, there are a lot of great tools who make this really, really simple. A couple that I use on a regular basis are Get Feedback and SurveyMonkey. And the first place I always go is email. Um, I think that that's kind of the easiest, most lowest hanging fruit, I guess, when it comes to asking these types of questions. So you can, you can use a survey tool like these to build out um, an online survey that you can send through a lot of different channels. But I think, I think email is the first one you really want to focus on. Um, as you're building out a survey, a couple of things to keep in mind. You want to include both multiple choice questions and open-ended responses, so you're gathering the right information. I found that if you only use multiple choice questions, you really kind of pigeonhole the, the reader into giving you a certain response instead of really being able to tell you what they want. So those open-ended questions where they can write a, a paragraph or even just a sentence or two, that's where the best information comes from. So make sure that you have a good mix of both types of questions within your survey. So you can really find out what exactly they want to be reading from you. Um, as far as distribution, once you've gotten past the email crowd, you can also think about putting this out on your website or promoting it on social media, going through those channels. Um, think about forums where your target audience spend time, spends time. Is there places like Reddit or like an inbound.org where you can distribute this or at least, you know, try to do a focus group of sorts where you go in and, and have a, a group of people who kind of fit who your target audience is, answer a couple of questions for you. 
all of these things are extremely valuable and they're going to inform your blog strategy in a way that you just, you can't get it. You can't get this information any other way. So I think it's important to do this regularly, not just do it one time and say, yay, we did it. We're done. But to keep, keep pulling your audience as your, your blog goes over time and, and as time passes. So you're always really keeping a finger on the pulse of what your audience wants from you because giving them a voice, it not only informs your strategy, but it also makes them feel like you value them more because you, you're asking for their opinion and you're asking for their feedback and then you're literally putting it into action. Well, hopefully you are, but we're gonna talk about how you do that next. So, step two is to, once you've gathered the information from your survey or from your focus groups or whatever you, you do to gather this feedback is to start looking for the patterns. So what are the common themes? What are the topics? What are the questions to your audience wants to learn more about from you? Um, obviously you want this to be niche specific or blog specific, but um, you really want to look for the patterns and what the responses are. So, you can use something as simple as an Excel spreadsheet to kind of keep track of these or Google Doc um, or even just literally build out a, a list of questions or topics that you're seeing kind of repeated in pattern from the responses that you're getting. Um, I think that it's important to really document these and not just keep them in your head because when they're on paper, they become easier to kind of plan around and to, to really grasp and to, to get strategic about, I think that that's the first step. And the other thing I think that's important about looking at the patterns is, if you're even if you're a team of one person like me, um, I think it's important to take your information and have somebody else look at it with you. If you're a team, that's great. You can brainstorm as a team and really dive into um, what the different perspectives your group has on the feedback that you've gathered. But I think when it's stuck with one person, that's sometimes where you get into trouble because you, you miss things that the data may be trying to indicate or um, you get caught up on a, on a specific point and you let a lot of the feedback that you've gathered just kind of go to waste. So I think it's important to document what you found as common themes within the data you've collected and then discuss it with at least one other person if you can and really dive into what can we do better? What are the common themes here? How can we use this and build a new strategy that's better and more effective? So that's the next step. Step three is to make a new plan. And one thing that's kind of common, unfortunately, with, with strategy for, especially for teams, for company teams, is that it's hard to be flexible and it's hard to be open to change when you've been doing something for a long time. So I think the first step here is to be willing to reformulate your blog strategy to maybe bring in some new tools, some new topics, some new approaches to maybe content formats or the things that you're writing about. Um, you have to be open to, to change and not just say, this is the way we've always done it. We're going to keep doing it this way. It, it's how we do things. That's a very dangerous mindset. So once you have this data, you found the patterns, then it's time to start putting that information into action. And because you're so flexible and you're so willing to change, oh, bless you, um, you're gonna build out a new content calendar based on the information that you've gathered. And so a lot of the clients that I work with use a tool like CoSchedule or Trello to really get a good plan and a good handle on how this is gonna be executed effectively. I think it's important to really prioritize the topics that you're gonna tackle moving forward based on highest volume of requests, or this is the biggest question that we saw asked on a, you know, that was the most common out of the, the feedback data that we collected. Um, that's, that's a good approach to it. Um, if you have, if you're wanting to organize your content calendar by theme, you can do it that way. But I think that if you see there are some common questions that are being asked over and over again, those are the ones that need to be answered first, or those are the how-tos that need to be built out first. And so it can be tempting to jump on the easiest kind of to create posts first, but I would really encourage you to tackle those posts that your audience really wants from you on a first come first serve basis. Um, when, you can, when you can let them indicate what they want from you and then you can immediately act on that. I think that that's a great, um, it shows that you're listening. It's a, it's a great indicator of that you're leveraging the feedback that these people took time to give you. 
So be open to changing your strategy. Don't get stuck in, this is how we do it. Build out a new content calendar. There are lots of great tools out there that make this super simple. If you're not using them already, you can, or if you wanna keep things really simple, it's just important to document it. A lot of people don't take the time to document their strategy, and it's important to do that so everybody's on the same page. And then prioritize based on what your audience has told you that they want from you. Um, so from here, talked a little bit about tools in the last slide, but I wanna talk about specifically content-related tools and how they make your strategy and your blog content better and more effective. So one of the first ones that's kind of a no-brainer, and a lot of you probably do this already, is to use Google's related searches tool. So you have all of these ideas, you have a rough list, list of topics you're gonna cover with your blog content, but you wanna start thinking about your headline strategy and your keyword approach. And so these, especially these tools, because they are free versions, or they are free, just kind of how they are, like the Google related searches tool, um, I think that those are a very common sense place to start. So what I do is with Google's related searches, I will type in some of the topics I'm thinking about, and then I will look at some of the related searches that comes up so I can get other ideas. I can see about um, adding specificity to kind of a high level query that I started with. So for example, if you were a business that organized closets, for example, and you typed in that you wanted to do a blog post about closet organization, in the related searches, you might see things like how to organize a small space or, um, cabinet organization or um, you know like like Pinterest style inf infographics on how to better organize a closet I'm pulling this off the top of my head and I'm feeling like this is a very strange example to use right now but um, that just kind of gives you some more ideas on what can be what can feel like a kind of limited topical area so use that Google related searches tools to get other ideas and to look at other keywords that are related to what you're which you're gonna write about as well. The Google uh, Keyword Planner tool is also great for this. Again, I think that that's, that's kind of a common tool that a lot of people use, but if you don't know about that, it's free. You have to have a Gmail account, but it, you can go in there and look at um, keywords for the topic that you're wanting to write about, the competition for the keywords, things like that. If you're not into keywords, it's not that important, but it's still good for brainstorming and getting new ideas. Um, Buzzsumo is another tool that I use quite a bit. Um, I use the free version because I'm an extremely cheap person, <laughs> but there is a paid version that's a lot more advanced and has a lot better data. But it shows you what the top 10 most shared keywords uh, are for a specific topic. You can, or you can organize by date, location, content type. You can see what kind of social traction it's getting. Um, it's, it's extremely helpful for seeing what what kind of similar content is out there already and what's doing well. So if you're thinking about writing about a certain topic, this is a good idea to kind of keep an eye on your competition and see what's already been written and see what's working well and what's not working so well. So again, it's a, it's a great tool as you're formulating this new strategy and you're building things out. It's kind of the next step in the plan is getting a little bit more specific and making data-based decisions about what you're going to do and how you're gonna execute. So you're not just, again, you're not just guessing, you're, you're moving off of data, you're moving off of numbers and, and real hard facts instead of just making assumptions and moving ahead without um, any real data to back up what you're doing. So those are my two favorites. Um, again, I think that they're great tools for working on your headlines for your blog posts. Um, getting a keyword approach, really getting a feel of, of what some related topics might be. The, the point here is just to work smarter and not harder and to make your decisions based from real data, not just assumptions or what you think is a good approach. Always try to use, especially if there's free tools out there. I mean, it's silly almost not to use these tools. They're fantastic. So the other thing that I think is really important about um, coming up with a strategy and making sure that it's highly relevant and interesting and something that converts for your blog is thinking about timeliness. So look at the news and ask yourself, is there data that I can synthesize to illustrate a point that no one is making yet? This is especially great for evergreen content and creating that type of content that's, that's good for years or months and it's not, it ages well. So it's, it's still good 
even after you've published it. And people are still coming to it month after month. This is something that I do when I'm writing for places like Copy Hackers or Conversion Excel. Um, I really try to think about what data points I can pull together to say something new and fresh that hasn't been said yet. Other questions to ask yourself, um, are there shifts within my niche opening the door to new challenges, nuances, and points of struggle? If so, what do people need to know about overcoming those obstacles? So what, what can you tell them to uh, build authority for yourself as a writer and for the company that you're writing for or the brand that you're writing for? What do they need to know and how can you prepare them? What can you teach them that they don't already know that's maybe timely or relevant to something that's coming up in, in their industry or with a shift or with a trend? Think about, think about kind of being at the cutting edge of that and really keep a finger on the news so you know what you need to be talking about to your audience so that you're seen as a go-to source of information. That's a, that's a great way to build authority quickly and easily. And then last, do I have unique data that I can share that brings new insight into an ongoing conversation? So original data, original research gets shared all the time because it's original and people, anytime they want to link out to it, they have to reference your post. So that's great for building out backlinks and, and that's good for the quality score of your website. And I know that that's kind of getting into a more specific side of blogging, but um, really thinking about publishing original data and taking the time to put out a survey or to put out um, research, conduct research and, and gather the data points so you can have this, this fresh perspective and this fresh piece of data to share with your audience is extremely valuable. And that's what can keep people coming back again and again. And it, in turn, as more people come to your website and they're, they're seeing you as a source of authority and they're coming to know you and trust you, that drives conversions as well. Maybe not right off the bat, but over time, it does for sure. And I've seen that happen again and again for the companies that I work with. Step six, be original. Um, I kind of touched on this in the last slide, but so often I see companies just, they're saying the same thing that's already been said a million times before. You know, they're writing the same roundup style post or they're just simply rehashing a post that they found on a competitor's website. It's just not that effective. You wanna contribute something that's fresh and new to the online conversation around your topic. You wanna to take a new angle, draw a new conclusion, research fact, of course, um, and not just restate what's already been said because then people just, you know, they have their sources for those pieces of information probably. Um, they're not gonna to come to your site if you're just saying the same thing that everybody else has already said. So try to have, try to have a new take, have a hot take. Um, have, have something new to say to the conversation that's happening and, and make sure that it's, that it's interesting and that it's backed up with lots and lots of data points. Um, I think that this is something, again, that when I'm writing for places like Copy Hackers or Sumo Me, places like that that are really seen as go-to places for their niche, this is what they always ask me for and this is what they're looking for. So. A lot of times that means tying together different points to illustrate a larger idea. So for example, one of the posts I wrote for Copy Hackers um, was about mirror neurons and how that relates to emotion and persuasion in sales writing. And it was a really long post. I think it was probably more than 4,500 words. But what I had to do when I was constructing that was look for different examples. Um, I looked at everything from the ASPCA, the you know, the animal refuge shelter, um, everything from them to Velveeta's ads from the 30s and pairing that with research and different studies and scientific data, um, I was able to kind of connect the dots with my idea here and keep backing up the point that I was making that emotion and per persuasion are closely tied together and that there's a very strategic way you can tap into those when you're writing. Um, that, pro that post is something that even now, 18 months later, after I've written that, I'm still really proud of. It still performs really well uh, for the keyword that we targeted. It still gets lots of traffic, and it's still driving conversions for the Copy Hacker site. I just recently asked Joanna for the numbers on this, so I don't have them yet, but I know that it's something that aged really well on her site, and it still performs well. And I think that that's kind of a testament to. Um, the strategy and this approach of 
being original and connecting the dots and really making an interesting point. Honestly, it's almost like writing a research paper when you were in college. You're, you're finding these different um, sources and these different examples that really spell out the point you're trying to make. And anybody can do that, and I think that that's when you're using uh, the information that you've gathered from your audience to really find out what they want from you, and then you're taking that approach, I think that that's almost a guaranteed home run for blog content and for driving conversions with your blog. Step seven, this is the last step. Um, I think it's important to integrate your story, and a lot of people forget to do this because it can be scary to share personal experiences that are both good and bad. A lot of people don't want to share the bad things that they've learned along the way or the mistakes that they've made or talk about the times that they failed. Um, I think that those failure stories especially are extremely powerful and they really help connect with the audience. Um, they break down the walls between you and your readers because it shows that you're human, you know, that there's another person on the other side of this blog article and that they're willing to share the good and the bad with the audience and that they're showing they've learned things along the way and that it hasn't all been unicorns and rainbows you know they're willing to kind of show that human side and I think that that's kind of another hallmark of really successful content that connects with readers that gets shared that drives return on investment for blogs it's being able to have that story element and so often it gets left out. So I think that that's kind of the last thing to remember about all of this. So the bottom line here, I've rambled for a really long time, so I'm gonna wrap up soon, I promise. Um, the bottom line here is that blogging is an investment of time and money to drive ROI. Your approach has to be strategic. You can't just make assumptions, you can't just guess. The big thing to remember here is to always let your audience tell you exactly what they want from you and then execute on it in the best way you can. So again, I've kind of walked you through the steps on how you do that. Um, I think it's fairly simple and fairly straightforward. There are a lot of great tools out there that make this simple. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of the bottom line here is to, to take this approach and really rethink your strategy and be open to making some changes. So I'm going to pause now um, and take some questions. I have no idea what time it is. Oh, look, here I am. Hi. Great. Okay, so I'm closing this. There we are. Okay. Uh, we have a few questions. I, you know, I, what I'm really happy that you spoke about, um, and for me as an advocate for using emotion and you know, customer centricity, that is my go-to. I'm constantly, you know, advocating for it. That's what I built a business on, obviously. Um, but just really, as you say, speaking to your customers, not making those assumptions that you think you know what your customer wants when they don't, you know, it's just you guessing. Um, and as you said, at the end of the day, the data is out there. You just have to go and get it. Um, so I really love the approach and I love the idea of storytelling. I can tell you that my most successful um, articles or even emails that I send are always the personal ones when I tell an embarrassing story or if I tell, mm -hmm. a, you know, I, I talk about a failure that I've had um, it, or even, you know, um, as a funny example, when I send an incorrect email or I'm missing a link in an email and you say, you know, oops, you know, error or whatever, you send a correction of an email, that gets like a hundred percent open rate, right? Because people want to connect with you and people want to feel that you are human too and that there's a person sitting behind the screen that's actually talking to them. So I think, um, thank you, Tina. I think um, storytelling is so important um, and I love that you brought that up. Um, we have quite a few questions, so um, I've been filtering them through. Uh, let's see. Um, okay, so we'll start with Kate's question, and she asks, on timeliness, are there any specific tools you use to identify those timely concepts or news? Or uh, they just come up in a regular industry-related reading you do on a basis? So where do you find this, um, you know, timeliness thing where you know, 
identify those important times where you need to change stuff? Yeah, I think that I go to Twitter. First of all, I look at what's being discussed kind of in my niche on Twitter. I think that's a great source for finding those trends. And then, like you said, it's also a lot of just industry related uh, reading and, and looking into what's being discussed. Also forums like uh, Inbound for me is especially helpful to see what people are asking questions about, um, the points of struggle that people are discussing. That's been really helpful for me to really kind of find out, um, you know, what are the what are the things that are changing or what are the things that are people that people are struggling with right now. So that's kind of my approach with a short answer. <laughs> yeah. No, I love using inbound.org. I think um, it is such a great place to see what people specifically when within our industry but there's all sorts of different industries of people just bringing up topics i mean um you know even talking about politics can you know can be relevant for your blog post even if you're very far from the politics in your industry so that's always a really cool thing um to look at um john asks do you include survey links in blog posts or are you just sending surveys to your existing email list? So for me, I always send it to my existing email list first. Um, then about a week later, it'll go up on my blog with a link to the survey within the blog post. And then I'll, like I said, I'll use the other channels like social media to also share it that way. If I am not getting a lot of response, then I'll put it kind of as a, as a slider on a website, on my website or um, I will do some one-to-one -one reach out where outreach where I will um, email people that I want to get feedback from specifically and, and kind of ask them to be my my mini focus group if I know that they're a good fit for the audience so yeah I think that that's kind of a good approach there are a lot of different ways you can do it but I think that that's a good starting place fantastic and I'm gonna throw in my regular tip which actually happens to be um, one of my favorite articles that I wrote for Copy Hackers, I think it was a year and a half ago, about thank you pages. So thank you pages are the most, you know, unused real estate that there is. And I actually do a lot of poll surveys uh, and surveys on thank you pages. And the reason is, um, it is, <laughs> it's called a uh, foot in the door technique. So once someone has performed a certain action, they're much more prone to perform another one. So if someone subscribed to your blog, um, it is so easy to say to them, hey, what would you like to read about? Right, because they've already taken that step where they've signed up and they're ready to get your content. Um, so ask them. You can ask them on the thank you page itself. So what you usually do is you say, "Hey, you know, go to your email inbox and you'll see an email from me." You can do that too, and you can ask them in the email itself once someone's subscribed. But why don't you poll the people right from within your website before they leave your website? Ask them on the thank you page. I've seen. 70 and 80 percent increase in respondent in response rate just by doing that so i always love to plug that in because the thank you page is just so underrated and it should be loved so use your thank you pages indeed <laughs> um nicole wants to know what if you're just starting out and you don't necessarily have an audience to poll yet that's a good question, and that's a big problem for a lot of people. Um, I think that that's where the focus groups or the forums or participating in, participating in the spaces where your target audience spends time, I think that that's where that really pays off. So for me, when I was getting started and I had maybe 20 people on my email list, I would go to the people that I wanted to be on my email list and I would ask them questions. So I did a lot of one-to-one -one outreach. And I know that Emma earlier in the chat said something about getting on the phone. I think that that's a great tip too. get on the phone or go meet with people who fit who your target audience is and ask them questions. People are there and it's super intimidating sometimes to make that reach and to put yourself out there in that way. But that's how you find that information. And that's that's how you get those pieces of data that inform the strategy and make you better and make you more effective. And give you the voice of customer. Exactly. Right. Which is so important because we like, we think we need to make up the words. We think we have to make words up in our mind. But if you actually speak to a few of your customers, they're going to give you their actual words. You don't have to make anything up. It's there. So I love customer interviews. Um, 
So Joseph asks, what are some of the content calendar tools that you use um, that they could try out too? Yes. Yeah, so I know that I mentioned CoSchedule. That's the one that a lot of my clients use. It's kind of the fancy one. It's a little bit more expensive, I think, um, but it's super effective and you can do your social strategy from within the tool, which is great. You can push it out through social right there. It's great for teams too as well because the team sharing and there's like a chat feature and I'm kind of rambling about this tool. but. CoSchedule is fantastic. Um, Trello is kind of a simpler version, um, which is more like a note card style, but that's that's really effective as well. Those are the two that I use most often. If you don't want to invest in a tool at all, um, I would just say use something like a Google Sheet or um, even just a Google Doc to build things out. That's what most of the people here in the chat were talking about, by the way, Google Sheets. Um, I think if you're going to use it, it doesn't matter. Like, obviously there are really cool tools you can use, but as long as you make sure you're using it, that's what really matters. So um, Google Sheets could work too. Um, John, so John says, when you have a very specific service like student loan repayment strategies, that's very specific, <laughs> um, and there is only so much to write about it. Um, is it, do you think it's better to focus on just a few pieces of content with highly targeted keywords? This is also kind of the SEO brink there um, and link building rather than actually uh, Pumping out content all the time like new content. Okay, so I have when I was getting started I worked with a lot of different industries like heating and cooling and a medical industry person and Yes, I think that that is the approach that works. I think you need to focus on quality over quantity and building out really helpful long form pieces of content that are targeted to your keyword that are really home run pieces rather than just cranking out maybe 500 words once a week. Don't do that. It's a waste yeah. of your time. It's a waste of your energy. It's not going to help you focus on building out maybe one or two pieces a month that are extremely valuable that are right on the mark for what your audience needs to hear from you and that help your, your search, your, your SEO efforts. And don't worry so much about producing oodles of content. That's, I don't think that that's the point. I think you want to be the person who's the go-to source for really good content rather than the person who's putting stuff out, but nobody's really reading it. I couldn't agree more. Um, at the end of the day, SEO isn't what it used to be. It's not about keyword stuffing anymore. It's about being, um, it's about delivering the content that your customers want. And even on my blog, I'm usually put out two blog posts a month. That's my capacity. That's how much I can do because each, each one of my articles is about 5,000 words. And there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of research that goes into it. So I'd rather do that than push out, as you say, 500 words every week, which no one's going to read. It's not interesting and it presents no value. Um, and I think this comes down to what you were saying before about the strategy. Like if you know the goal of your business um, and what you're trying to do with your blog, then it's easier than just like, okay, I just need to stuff some keywords in there and just get like loads of, um, you know, articles out there so that people can see me. It's more about moving towards your customer's goals and your business goals. Um, what else? So we have Chad. Um, how about going to top retailer in your town and in your niche and asking them what they ask the most? Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of a tip maybe more than a question, Chad, but that's really cool. Yeah. Why don't you actually go into a brick and mortar store um, if that's your industry? And ask them, you know, what do people ask the most? That's really cool. Yes, yeah, support. I will um, say quickly on this point. Um, if you have a support team, if you're a company and you have customer support or customer success, those are the people who know exactly what questions are being asked on a regular basis. They are good as gold. If you will give them the voice and give them the opportunity to share what they know with you, they often have some of the best insights for what your customers want and what they're struggling with and what they need to hear from you. Fantastic. Um, Tina asks, are there any other three tools like BuzzSumo um, that she can use? Mm, um, I'm sure that there are, but I don't know what they are off the top of my head. So if anybody else knows, uh, let her know in the chat. But those, the ones that I mentioned are the ones that I use regularly. For me, I try to keep things pretty simple and I don't use a ton of tools. I just use a couple that work really well for me and for what I'm trying to do. But I'm sure that there are other resources out there for you know, for doing those types of things. 
Yeah, no, Buzzsumo is fantastic and you can use it for free. So why not? Um, Amy asks, what are your favorite content marketing blogs slash experts that you both love to read? Uh, do you want to go first? No. You don't. <laughs> okay. Well, obviously, <laughs> Copy Hackers, Conversion XL, those are the two that I've mentioned a lot throughout this. Um, Talia is a great resource. Um, I think that Unbounce has a lot of great resources. Um, gosh, there's so many. Um, those are the ones that are coming to my mind off the top of my head. But um, Buffer also has a great blog. I love them for content marketing mm, resources. True. Um, yeah, those are kind of my go-to people for that specific type of writing. But, oh, and um, Enchanting Marketing is also a good one too. It's not really content marketing specific, but it's uh, writing specific. And she has a lot of kind of high-level tips that are very effective for just making your strategy better and making you a better writer. So those, I love those. Cool. Um, for me, so Copy Hackers is a given. I read everything that they put out. Um, I read your stuff, Kaylee, um, which is, I, I love. Um, I think it's brilliant. Uh, Backlinko is fantastic, John. I agree. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Brian Dean does a great job with such fantastic guides out there. Um, Andy Crestadina does mm -hmm. the same with Orbit Media. They have great guides like really good informative guides and infographics telling you how to do stuff which i love um i also read the buffer blog which i think is good and i also read dan arielli's blog mm. um who is sort of like a mentor to me i'd say um everything to do with behavioral economics and just how people buy things and how they think and um, anything to do with psychology like really intrigues me. Um, so I definitely read a lot um, of his stuff. He has a really cool blog. He also has an online course that he does for free, which is really cool about how people make decisions. And I think that's pretty important when you're marketing to people. <laughs> um, Conversion Excel has a fantastic blog. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, those are my go-to. Um, let us know in the chat what you like to read, guys. Um, I can see some of you are saying, um, oh, Jessica Merring. Yes, yeah, she's fantastic. Um, cup of copy. <laughs> um, copy hackers, of course. We've got Backlinko. Um, oh, someone mentioned Get Uplift. Thank you. Um, that's cool. Let's see. We have a few more questions coming in. Um, Oh, what software do you use for surveys on thank you pages? Um, so I'm pretty straightforward, uh, Laura. I use Typeform. Uh, really easy to integrate with your, um, on your thank you page, on any page actually, so it's really simple. Or if you don't want to actually integrate it because you don't want to pay for Typeform, you can just have a link there and say, hey, do you mind just answering a few questions and sending them to that link? Looks great. Uh, if Rand Fishkin can do a free uh, poll on Typeform, anyone can. <laughs> Just don't pay for it. <laughs> uh, though they have an awesome um, platform and program for paying, but just so you know. Um, yeah, so that is what I use for forms. Um, and I think we've answered everyone's questions. That was really good. Let's see. Um, yeah, got all of those. Uh, okay, no, I think we've got everyone. Awesome. Um, can oh, how does the art of copywriting influence how you write your blog posts? And who are your favorite copywriting mentors as a blogger? Okay, <laughs> that's a good question. Go for um, so for me, I kind of live in the world of copywriting and the art of copywriting and it's what I write about a lot of the time. So it influences what I'm blogging about a lot. I think about it a lot as I'm writing in a specific voice for either myself or for a client that I'm working for. Um, I think about I think about how to persuade someone. Um, I use a lot of research that I've learned about um, you know just just copywriting formulas like pain, agitator, solution, things like that as I'm writing to just kind of inform what I'm doing and take a more strategic approach to it. Um, obviously, Copy Hackers is probably my biggest mentor. That's somebody I, I started writing with Joanna a couple of years ago, and she just always has fantastic content on her site. 
um, not just by her, but by a lot of different writers who contribute there. Um, so yeah, that's, that's my go-to person for copywriting mentor, I guess. But um, it definitely has a big role in all of the work that I do, not just, not just my own blog content, but when I'm writing for clients as well. Agreed. Um, Kaylee, tell us where people can find you um, and contact you and read your stuff. Um, yeah. yeah, so I just put the link um, on the chat. It's kayleemore.com. My first name is very kind of hard to spell. Um, I also have a newsletter that I send out twice a month with typically writing tips. Sometimes I talk about freelancing. Sometimes I talk about working from home and how it's only and I'm sad. <laughs> I'm not sad today. This is great. Um, but yeah, that's where you can find me. I'm also on Twitter. I'll put that link over here. That's where I spend most of my time during the day. I use it as my water cooler since again, I'm a lonely person who works from home alone with her dog. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's, that's where I spend most of my time is Twitter. I'm also on other places, but that's the best place to get in touch with me. And if you want to send me an email, I'll put that in the chat as well. And we can chat over email. Perfect. Um, okay, I want to thank you so much for today. I learned a lot. As I told you, I had you on for my own personal reasons. <laughs> I've learned a couple of really cool things. Um, we're going to have the recording. I'm going to send you guys the recording, the transcript, and a few screenshots of like the most important uh, slides that we've seen today. So no worries about that. Just look out for that email in a few days. Um, thank you everyone for joining us today. It was a really cool turnout. And thank you, Katie, so much for the great content. Thank you for having me. This was really nice. I had a good time. Thanks. Have a fantastic day, guys. Bye. Bye.